Welcome to the Henry AI Labs walkthrough of Keras code examples. Keras has provided 56 code examples implementing popular ideas in deep learning. This ranges from the basics such as simple MNIST and IMDB text classification, all the way to cutting edge research ideas such as knowledge distillation, supervised contrastive learning, and transformers. We'll also explore fun generative examples like variational autoencoders and cyclegan. My contribution to these code examples is to explain every single line of code in each of them, walking through each of the individual Keras examples. I'm not the author of these code examples. Please consider starting the GitHub repositories to show support to the original authors. One of the biggest criticisms of deep learning and deep neural networks is that they operate as black boxes. It's hard to know exactly why a deep neural network makes a given prediction. This Keras code example walks through the GradCam class activation visualization algorithm. This is one of the first steps towards interpretability. At least with this algorithm, we can get a sense of what regions of an image the model or the convolutional neural network is looking at in order to make a prediction. And this is done by seeing uh, which individual regions have the highest uh, class activation as you extract a layer from the convolutional neural network and see uh, which parts of it have the highest values. And you can also inspect the direction of the gradients and the magnitude of the gradients to see which regions of the image that have been processed are now accounting for the most gradients and the most updates to the neural network as it's trained on an image like this elephant image. This tutorial begins with the standard imports, NumPy, TensorFlow, Keras, uh, the image visualization library, matplotlib, and then the color map. So now what we're doing is we're importing the exception pre-trained model. Keras offers many pre-trained models under Keras applications. We have the exception network, VGG, ResNets, MobileNets, DenseNets, up to efficient nets. So we already have these pre-trained models that we can use for these applications. And this is really important for what we're doing with uh, GradCam visualization because we're trying to see the activations of a pre-trained deep convolutional neural network. So we have model builder equals exception dot exception. So it's kind of interesting that exception itself is an object and we kind of see this redundancy in the uh, chaining of calling this. And then we're going to use the preprocess input from this uh, function as well as the decode prediction. This is the TensorFlow documentation of the Keras application's exception model. And it's important to see where my mouse is and understand that there are uh, a bit of an ambiguous naming with this. So we see how we have uh, Keras applications, and then we have in capital letters the pre trained models where you just do uh, include top, and then we have also these objects. So the exception object has decode predictions and preprocess input as additional uh, functions that you can chain on exception.decode uh, predictions and then also you construct it with exception.exception. .exception. So there is a little bit of a difference between the capital letter pre-trained models and then the lowercase pre-trained models in the TensorFlow syntax right now. But all we need to know is that we're uh, loading in the exception pre-trained deep convolutional neural network as well as its pre-processing and uh, decoding its prediction functions. The objective of the GradCam algorithm is to inspect the activations of a given layer in the convolutional neural network, in this case the last convolutional layer, before these features are flattened and passed to a dense layer that are mapped to classification logits. So we're going to index a layer in our exception network with its name. So it's uh, conventional in Keras, in, uh, Keras models to have a layer and then name the layer. So you might name the layer based on uh, its position in the network depth-wise, so say uh, conv8, conv9, conv10, and so on. That's one way of naming these uh, uh, layers in a neural network. In this case, they have a pretty clever architecture where they have separable convolutions and these different blocks that have different things. So say you're using a ResNet and you have heterogeneous, uh, maybe like bottleneck blocks and normal blocks or you know, you have you don't uh, just repeat the same block over and over again, then you might need a more creative naming scheme. But generally, we just index this with the uh, depth in the network. So in this case, we're looking at block 14. And we're taking out this convolutional layer from the pre trained model in order to see the activations of it as we pass this elephant image through it. So we also uh, get the classification layers, we get the average pooling, the predictions, we're going to use this in order to see uh, what the model is predicting at the end. So we want to correlate this intermediate layer of the neural network, this intermediate convolutional layer, with the predictions all the way at the end to try to get these gradients and see what it looks like uh, in the original input space. This block of code just uses the Keras utils get file with this uh, URL link, saving it as this African elephant.jpg, display the image with that IPython library, and then this first function, uh, get image array. Uh, it takes in the image with the path with the Keras preprocessing dot image load image. You pass in the file path, which is going to be our uh, elephant image dot JPEG. It resizes it to 299 by 299 by three. 
and then we convert it to a NumPy array with float32 data points. Then we expand the axis so that we can uh, pass in just one example for inference. It's common to see this when you do uh, one example for inference in Keras to expand the dimension so you have one and then height width channels, one being a batch size of one because these deep neural networks are uh, designed to take in batches as inputs. Now that we've loaded in a pre-trained deep convolutional neural network, the exception network, as well as our elephant image and the necessary pre-processing functions, we're ready to get into the meat of this algorithm, the making the grad cam heat map. We do this by calling model.getLayer, passing in the indexed name of the layer. It's common to do something like when you have keros.add dense, and then you have the units, you then pass in name equals dense one or something like this. So we're using this name in order to index the pre-trained exception network. So we're using this to store the last convolutional layer, and then we construct a model by calling the keros.model, passing in the original exception input layer, and then having it truncate at the end with the last convolutional layer. So this model takes in the same image as the exception network, but it's gonna output the features of this last convolutional layer. So this last convolutional layer, it could be something like uh, having 32 by 32 height width feature maps, and then might have uh, 256 such uh, feature planes is what they also call that. So it could be a 32 by 32 by 256 uh, feature cube, which is the usual intermediate uh, tensors in these deep convolutional neural networks. Although usually they're uh, tensors because they have a batch size as well. In this case, we're just passing a single image through. So it just has that cube shape of height by width by uh, number of feature planes. So then we're gonna construct another classifier model to be looking at these intermediate activations to correlate them with the activations in the last convolutional layer and then visualizing them on the original image. So we do this by having our classifier input is gonna be this last convolutional layer. And then, so basically we're uh, looking at the latter half of the network. So first we've taken apart the first half of the network and now we're looking at the second half of the network from the last convolutional layer onwards where we reconstruct the model with the classifier input starting from here all the way into the last layer of the original model where it spits out the uh, classification logits because exception was pre-trained on ImageNet classification. So in this first block of code, we split the model in the first half and then we take the first half and then we use it to index into constructing the second half. So we have one big deep neural network, sort of like this sentence, and we've taken it and we have this half, we split it and then we have this latter half. So Hopefully that made some sense of this idea of taking apart a big deep neural network into two parts and then we're trying to visualize the intermediate features by doing this kind of analysis. TensorFlow's Gradient Tape is a relatively new API to inspect gradients in TensorFlow. Many of you may be familiar with the Autograd package in PyTorch and it's one of the ways that I think PyTorch sells itself is it has such an easy way of doing Autograd and TensorFlow is building out a similar functionality with Gradient Tape is the name of it. So what this does is it lets you uh, look through the gradients. You can do uh, kind of like when you go through the first 60 minute Blitz PyTorch tutorial and you just do basic functions and then you just call the gradient and inspect the gradient of functions like uh, sine x or you know, ReLU activations or these kinds of things and you look at the activation of the function, uh, the gradient of the function, you can just do it with this autograd library. So what we're gonna be doing is we're gonna be using the gradient tape in order to get the gradients as we're passing in this elephant image and then looking through the classification layer and back propagating that all the way to this last convolutional layer output. The idea of gradients and derivatives is to understand how each individual parameter influenced the final output prediction and then update it accordingly. In this case, we're trying to look at the gradient for these last convolutional layer outputs with respect to the final class logic prediction. So in order to do this, we're gonna call tf.gradienttape as tape. This is the syntax that you use to tell TensorFlow that we wanna see the gradients as we're passing in these uh, forward passes and backward passes of these uh, chains of sequential processing. So first we take our last convolutional layer output and we get this by calling our model that we've constructed with this syntax with our image array. This is that elephant image that's been pre-processed into a float32 NumPy array. So we call uh, tape.watch on the last convolutional layer output and now we pass it into the classifier model. So our classifier model, it takes in the last convolutional layer and then it's gonna split out the uh, class logits on the classification task. So then we take the index of the top predictions and as well as the uh, channel of the top class. The top class channel is used to index the gradients with the tape.gradient function call, passing in the uh, output predictions with this indexing to get out the top prediction index and then passing in the last convolutional layer output to track where we wanted it to be watching the gradients in the original tape.watch function call.
So now what we're going to do is we're going to pool the gradients along each of these uh, channels. So it's important to take a step back and think about what we're doing. We're back propagating these gradients all the way back to this feature cube. Previously, we mentioned this as being, say, 32 by 32 by 256. Well, now instead of having 32 by 32 by 256 uh, values for uh, feature intermediate activations, now we have gradients occupying each of the positions in that 32 by 32 by 256. Now let's call it uh, like a derivative cube or a you know, gradient cube. So now we're going to be reducing the mean in order to make sense of this and get a uh, bit more, a better like summarization value to project onto the original image. The product of pooled gradients or pooled grads tells us how much each of these feature maps influence the gradients. So say we have these 256 uh, feature planes, imagining they're each 32 by 32, but we've pooled along this. So now we have one summarizing value, which is the mean intensity of each of these 256 uh, feature planes. And that's with respect to the gradient. So this summarizes the gradient of each of those feature planes. Now we're going to loop through and multiply the gradient, the summarizing value of the gradients, by each of the original feature planes to further see uh, how important it is with regard to the predicted class, because it could have a high gradient but still a low activation, and so on, so as we multiply this through to see what really the story is with respect to the gradients and the original activation. So last convolutional layer output are the original uh, activations of the forward pass, Pooled gradients are the summarizing values of the gradients in the backward pass. So now we take the channel-wise mean of the resulting feature map. So it's common to see, particularly if you study things like normalization layers, like the difference between, say, group normalization versus layer normalization versus batch normalization, and just as a very random example, but in the generative teaching networks, they talk about how they use this weight standardization technique as this particular way of uh, calculating these normalization values along these intermediate tensors and the intermediate activations of deep convolutional neural networks. Not that it has to be limited to deep convolutional neural networks, but I think it helps to understand. It's very intuitive understanding the height by width by channels, intermediate feature dimensions of deep convolutional neural networks. So now we're taking the channel wise mean. So the channel wise mean says, imagine you have this height by width by 250, or 32 by 32 by 256 feature plane. You're at position uh, zero, zero, the top left of the height width you're going to be taking the mean of the values down through the 256 uh, feature planes indexed at 0, 0. Then you slide it over, 0, 1, 0, 2, 0, 3, so on, 1, 0, 1, 1, so on, until you've calculated the mean along the channels. And now it, the resulting value is this 32 by 32 matrix that contains the uh, means as you go down the channel dimension of this intermediate feature plane. In which case, our intermediate feature plane now is the multiplication of the gradients times the uh, original forward pass activation. So hopefully that part makes sense. And in the end, we end up with this heat map because we have the channel wise mean, we pass in numpy.mean of the, our multiplied uh, thing here. And then we pass it the axis, axis minus one means do this along the channel dimension. Next, we normalize the heat map. So the values are between zero and one by dividing by the maximum value. Then we test drive it by passing in the image array of our elephant. And then we get our heat map of this uh, original set of the feature planes in the last convolutional layer. In this image, we see that we have about 10 by 10 feature uh, height by width of these feature maps. This is really common in uh, convolutional neural networks to spatially downsample the image and then the intermediate feature planes as you progress through the uh, neural network. In this case, it looks like we're at block 14 of the exception network. So it's common to say take the original 224 by 224 uh, image net image, and then it moves to say, uh, 222 by 222 after the first convolutional layer, then you might apply something like max pooling that brings it all the way down to 110 by 110, and so on as you progressively downsample it uh, spatially. So it's not uncommon to see this 10 by 10 in the last convolutional layer of a convolutional network. It's common to see 10 by 10, and then this would be uh, really deep. So it'd be like 10 by 10 by 512, 256, some, value, some number like that is the channel. So that's kind of what this intermediate uh, feature plane would look like. So the next step is to create a superimposed visualization. And basically we're gonna be uh, just, the way that convolutional neural networks work is they uh, slide along these three by three kernels and progressively they aggregate their window. So whereas attention looks at the entire image at once, convolutional neural networks look at these small patches and then they build it up. So it's like a message passing network, like uh, kind of like a graph network, but with, a, uh, with this grid structure graph. So they, propagate the messages and eventually these local three by three windows, by say layer 10, they are seeing um, you know, a much larger 
three to the 10 by three to the 10 sized window as you're aggregating these kernels. So what we're gonna be doing is basically just multiplying it in order to blow it up and uh, see how these individual uh, smaller patches map onto the original image. And you really can just multiply this because this region comes from, uh, if you imagine this is bigger, this particular activation that's really high comes from like this intermediate zone of the image, not the entire image. So in the end, we blow up our feature map activation, showing how much the original last convolutional output and the gradients of this prediction of African elephant in the classification layer of the pre-trained exception network influence the uh, predictions. This is the uh, multiplication of the gradients from this prediction with respect to this layer times the activations of this layer originally. So now we superimpose it by just increasing the size and quickly described how three by three convolutions aggregate these local windows that let you just kind of do this. Uh, blowing up to have this make sense and overall we end up with our visualization of where in the uh, original image the deep exception convolutional neural network is looking mostly as it's going to classify this image as an elephant so when the uh, exception network is making a prediction on this elephant most of the gradients are going into this region it's not having gradients on the grass or the sky it's looking at the features of the elephant so this is a really interesting uh, insight made possible by this advance in interpretability and deep learning, letting us visualize the intermediate class activations and get a sense of what these models are uh, looking at or what kind of features they're using to make these classifications for, in this case, the ImageNet dataset. Mm -hmm.